The time has come to unveil the secrets of the haunted city. Call of Cthulhu Arkham is the definitive guide to the signature setting of Call of Cthulhu and was used during the writing of the Graveyards of Arkham story. This hardcover tome details a sandbox campaign setting, over 250 locations, and more than 80 fully-fledged NPCs ready to drop into your story of mythos horror. Find all this and much more in Call of Cthulhu Arkham, available now from Chaosium.com or from your friendly local game store. Greetings, gentle viewer, and welcome back to Graveyards of Arkham. My name is Mark Meir, and it is my grim pleasure to serve as your keeper of arcane lore. But, as has been said before, a keeper is nothing without their players. So let's meet my players now, and a very special guest NPC. Hi, I'm Lucia Versprilli, and I will be playing Theodore Holt. Hello, I'm Becca Scott, but today you can call me Eleonora Birch. I'm Josephine McAdam, playing Detective Vic Mason. Patrick Logan, Dr. Archibald Desmond. And I'm Nora Ibrahim, and I'm playing Big Betty Briggs. Players, you find yourself standing at the door of Eleonora Birch, who has just admitted you to her home at 456 West Saltonstall Street in Arkham. Mary, could you fill up the teapot for me with hot water? I've laid out everything you'll need. It's all on the counter. Of course, Eleonora. Thank you. Please come in. Um, let's head into the parlor room. The dining room, as you can see, is overrun with donations right now. Please come in, come in. Um, and now, I know your names, but I don't know whose is who. So, uh, yeah, Vic? Vic Mason, yes. Betty? Yes. I, I would be Big Betty, yes. Well, I didn't want to add any adjectives that I didn't hear you use for yourself, but... Dr. Archibald? Uh, uh, yes, madam. <laughs> I was taught to do that by my husband. And Theodore Holt. Yes, of course. Nice to meet you. So nice to meet you as well. All of your reputations precede you, and as friends in town, I, I wanted to introduce myself. Eleanor Birch, obviously, as my note invitation said, but, well, I am the leader of the Daughters of Grace, and uh, have you heard of us? Yes. Sort of. Indeed. Yeah. It's hard not to hear of your charitable work in this city. Thank you. That means a lot. Well, I thought, if you are the people who are going to find Anna, I wanted to meet you and give you whatever help I could. Where did you uh, hear that we were looking for Anna? From, um, it was Hannah Claire Llewellyn who first mentioned that you had passed by. Right. And uh, Hannah is, of course, a gym, always volunteering at the soup kitchens whenever they pop up. You mentioned specifically, though, that we were investigators. That's right, that's what I've heard. Is that not correct? Well, I mean, yeah, but I thought we were kind of being a little, you know, inconspicuous about it. Was we not being inconspicuous? Mm. Suppose our cover's been blown. <laughs> well, the thing about being the leader of an organization is that I sort of have little birds everywhere, if you will. Well. Delightful ones, as you can hear chattering and laughing away in the dining room there. I hope. And indeed, uh, there are other women in the house. Uh, there was a woman named Mary, who Eleonora uh, instructed to fetch tea. Uh, there are also, as you pass through the house, you can see several women working in the dining room. There seem to be donated clothing that they seem to be sorting. And Eleonora leads you into the drawing room. Please, may I pour your tea? Please do. I do so. Uh, so you are correct, yes. It seems we are uh, investigating uh, the disappearance or assumed disappearance of Miss Anna Lund. 
You wouldn't know anything to help us in our investigation, perhaps? Well, that's what I'd like to find out. I'm happy to provide any information that might be in this brain rattling around that may be of use, but what do I know of Anna? She is a kind, beautiful thing who's helped at the soup kitchen as well. She's engaged to that handsome young boy, Cyrus. How did you hear about that? Oh, well, Cyrus's family is, of course, well known in Arkham, and I know them well. Mr. Holbrook was uh, very adamant about keeping that information hush-hush when we last spoke. Yeah, he seemed not too thrilled about that, uh, the fact that they was getting married. I am a terrible gossip. I am so sorry. <sighs> Do you ever forget what you were supposed to tell and not supposed to tell? <laughs> uh, yes, well, I just love a wedding. I was hoping I'd get a hand in planning it. Uh -oh. Here's the tea. The woman described uh, previously as Mary brings in a tea service and sets it down. Is there anything else you need, Eleonora? No, no, if you could just close the door and then I'll be back in in just a moment. I'm sorry today has been so hectic. Of course, I think we have things well in hand. You should take a well-deserved break. And, oh, hello, Mary Prentice. Good to see you as she closes the door behind her. Quick question. When I shook her hand, how did she feel? Uh, if you're wondering if she felt cold and corpse-like, yes. the answer <laughs> is no. It okay. felt like, okay. you know, the hand of a person okay. uh, who has body heat. <laughs> It's Thank a you. shame we must ask this question, but it must be asked. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> no, there was, yes, uh, you did not feel the touch of corpse flesh. It was, okay. in fact, the touch of a person. Is she perfectly symmetrical? <laughs> I mean, it, obviously. <laughs> well, clearly. I mean, we should have cast someone other than Becca Scott. <laughs> no, if the answer beauty. was no, but the answer is Very no. Suspicious. Certainly, uh, an attractive, uh, attractive lady. However, that sort of unearthly beauty that you'd noted in Nancy Holbrook and Gwendolyn Tillinghast, no, that is not the case. Are you and Mr. Holbrook close, then? If you were hoping to help plan the wedding? Well, I wouldn't say particularly close, but we are affiliated in a business sense. What sense the Sort is of that? business. Here I go, spilling gossip again, but you all seem very trustworthy. <laughs> that we are. Well, he has been a generous donor for the Daughters of Grace. And for that, I am very grateful to Mr. Hol Holbrook. Hmm. But was there any other sort of business that you two are intertwined in? Betty, <laughs> can you elaborate as to what you're alluding to? Well, I don't know if I should say, speak such words in front of a fancy lady, but was you, were you knocking boots? Were you intertwined in the sheets? Was you bumping uglies is what I'm trying to figure out. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think I know the matter to which you are referring, and I would just like to put to bed, no pun intended, oh, I see what you did whatever there. you are implying. Nancy and I have had a heart-to-heart -heart since she had some wild notion. No, Mr. Hallbook Jefferson, I was attempting to meet him discreetly to discuss the donation, and, well, obviously those attempts were thwarted by Nancy's love for her husband. Is his uh, involvement in the Daughters of Grace, at least financially, a recent change? Oh, I would say several months ago was when the initial meeting and donation and subsequent scandal and reversal of scandal all took place. Oh. Uh, just a misunderstanding. But what I don't get is that if, if I'm sure Nancy was involved, was, was Nancy not involved in the Daughters of Grace? No, no, she is not one of the Daughters of Grace. Of course, every time I see her, I open the door, as I do to all those society women, of which I must say I teetered on the edge of many years ago, but I have since stepped away from that group and have focused my efforts on helping women. Could I, I get a spot hidden from everyone? Hard success. Success, normal. Oh, I failed. <laughs> Regular success. Mm, those who succeeded do note that Eleonora is wearing on her left hand a ring. 
Interesting. Um, you go by Miss Eleonora Birch? Yes, uh, Miss. Miss is fine. And yet, uh, excuse me, I, but I can't help but notice a wedding ring on your hand. An old habit. I was married. He's passed. Oh, my condolences. Sorry to hear that. What, Thank you. What was his name? Tom. But it was six years ago, and I would say the blessing in my tragedy is that my life has been given to those less fortunate, particularly women. That is the goal of the Daughters of Grace, is to help women in poverty. We have scholarships and educational programs, and of course the donation drive you see going on, which if you have anything to donate, anything at all, or know anyone, we are taking those now. Uh, but, um, and yes. that's when you started your work then? Yes, that is when I joined Daughters of Grace. I see. And of course, the longer you're with them, the more you move up in the ranks. They refer to me as the eldest daughter now. But why, oh. why keep a charitable donation a secret is what I don't understand. I don't either. I mean, these gentlemen with their clubs and their... Perhaps he didn't want to be seen as donating to an organization that sometimes helps women in a precarious position that perhaps not all of these men want to see women fully educated. And I do appreciate Mr. Holbrook donating his, his generous wealth. I'll remind you that when that question was posed to Holbrook, he claimed that he didn't want to become an easy mark for every charity to come at him with their hand out. I was just trying to gauge her reaction to the same question. This tea that's here on the table, yeah. does it smell particularly floral or sweet? Uh, it seems to be Earl Grey. Okay. First, a general psychology check on this woman as she's been slinging a lot at us. Um, mainly about her relationship to Mr. Holcomb. To, Ms. Oh, to Mr. Holbrook? Mr. Holbrook, yes. So specifically, what are you trying to determine? This is her relationship with Holbrook. With her relationship with Holbrook and if she's been cagey about that. Hmm. Sure. Please make a psychology roll. Extreme success. Ooh. Ooh. She's quite skillfully dancing around the issue. She's not being entirely truthful regarding the relationship with Holbrook. Uh, Miss Birch, um, I hate to continue to pester you about what is considered yesterday's news, but... Doctor, you are no pester. Oh, thank you. Uh, I must ask, during that whole sordid affair, what was your opinion of uh, Mrs. Holcomb? Holbrook? Holbrook, yes. Nancy, if I'm being entirely truthful, she's a little uptight. And as many of these society ladies can be, a little closed in their circles. And that's not my favorite way for women to behave with one another. I think that if we can't change men's opinion of us, then sisters, mothers, we must all stick together. And did you notice a change about her? Nancy? Yes. Perhaps during this affair, something that changed about her that wasn't there before. Well, her demeanor towards me was obviously cold until we had a discussion and cleared everything up. And actually, the one thing I love about Nancy is her baking. She's an incredible baker. Mm. So we've heard. Uh, I don't mean to uh, be rude, but uh, could I ask, how long has your husband been passed? It's been six years. Six years. Do you have any experience with loss? Yes, unfortunately. I lost my son approximately four years ago. One carries grief with them and can see it in another. 
You said... But we must not dwell on these things. Right. You said his name was Thomas? I call him Tom. Of course. Getting back to the point at hand, when and where did you last see Anna? Well, that would have been at the soup kitchen. Two weeks ago, I'd say, perhaps. And you uh, said that we were here investigating Anna being missing, is that correct? That's what I was told by Hannah. And do you believe that she's missing? Well, I know young women can get cold feet when it comes to marriage. I know I did. I was, oh, just a young 28. Um, well, uh, I was younger than that even. Not important. I know a woman can get cold feet when she is anticipating her nuptials, and so I'm hoping that's all this is. You think that Anna's gotten cold feet and run off? I shudder to think what else it could mean when a young girl doesn't go home at night. Have you ever heard of uh, Mr. Holbrook's retreats, perhaps? I have heard something. I wish I could take a spa treatment, but <laughs> there's just no time. There's just so much to plan and so much to do and always more people in need. Question to the keeper. Um, I know it'd have to take some time and I could have done this while everyone was talking. Seeing as I've seen them many times, would I be able to draw the moth to some degree of accuracy? I think so, yes. Yes, and you've even seen drawn representations of it. So that's sometimes more helpful than having just seen something in life. So while this was going on, I'd do this and I'd say, Miss Birch, um, I, Apologies, uh, but I, I don't know if you'd even know this. Does this look familiar to you? And I point to a picture of the moth that I've drawn here. We've you been... drew this? Yes. A fine skill as an artist. Much appreciated. It's Have you lovely. seen this before? This, or something like it? Imagery, perhaps even in the past of your own uh, did you say charity? Yes, we are a charitable organization, the Daughters of Grace. Yes. Yes. I understand the Daughters of Grace were perhaps not founded around this time, but are connected to the assistance of particularly plague victims. Am I correct? Are you speaking of the pestilence? Yes, I am, actually. Well, I hate to spill all of our secrets, but we were originally created in 1705, around that time, to help those afflicted, afflicted by the pestilence. That's right. Your, your patron is Saint Aloysius, I believe? I have heard that saint's name thrown around, yes. The, the patron saint of, of plague victims. Plague victims. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, um, well, we are in service of what we like to call the kind mother. It's an idea, <clears throat> an ideal really, of giving, mm -hmm. of supporting, of sisterhood, and of treating everyone with respect, kindness. Did Anna seem like she was in trouble? Like she was in need? Did she ever confide in you in anything? Was she upset about anything? I wish I had an answer that were more helpful here, but I found her to be an absolutely delightful and unbothered young woman. When we were talking about the plague, showed her the moth, did I see a reaction to any of those things? Now you've just had an extreme success on that psychology, but we have moved on a bit, so I'm we afraid have. I'll be cruel and make you roll again. I expect and accept your cruelty. Could I do one as well? Yes, also? of course. Would you please do one as well? That's a failure. Extreme success. Excellent. <laughs> There was something when she saw the moth, the flicker. She hid it very well, but her answer again was not entirely, shall we say, forthcoming. I believe you when you say you want to help women in need. Indeed, that's the entire organization. And. Vic, with that extreme success that you got, because the conversation was centered around that, 
Eleonora is very sincere in her desire to help women. Mm. And particularly when she was discussing the kind mother, she became rather animated mm -hmm. and one might even say joyful. Could you tell us more about the kind mother? The kind mother resides in each of us, you see. She is what motivates us to do things that are selfless. She is the concept of giving. Nothing more. As you say, you do care for women and what happens to them. We are quite concerned with what may have happened to Anna. We are worried, we are quite worried with the things that we have seen in our investigations and surely any truthfulness you could give us would be most helpful. I ask again if you know anything of the moth, Dr. Desmond, Drew. Anna's fate may be in your hands. I do know that perhaps moths like that were found during the original pestilence, and for that I am fearful, if you must know. I worry that perhaps something like mosquitoes and malaria, perhaps these moths have something to do with what happened back then. And I do want to protect all of these girls in my care and all the others that we try and help. If you care about Anna, you gotta tell us if there's something about Mr. Holbrook that you've been holding back on because he was very displeased that him and that Cyrus and her are getting married. I think something foul may have happened, though we are not yet certain. I, I don't know of anything foul, I assure you. I only know of the intentions of the Daughters of Grace. And I assure you, they are pure. I did hear of your friend, the retired police officer, Mr. Wallace Phillips, yes. That's right, Phillips. Yes, um... I'm so sorry. He was... Slightly familiar with you, from what I understand. Not that you knew each other, but he knew of you. I'm curious, have we asked at all why you specifically called us here, just because we're looking into Anna? But that's exactly it. I wanted to meet you. I wanted to know if there's anything I know that could help you. And if there doesn't seem to be, I'm, I'm very sorry. Have you always lived in this house in particular? I know you said a couple of years ago you shied away from higher society. I purchased this home after Tom's death. It was too painful. What happened with your previous house, if I might ask? It's still in the family. Does anyone care for it? It's likely a large house. Uh, it is cared for, yes. Well cared for. Is that? Just trying to recall, is that the house on, that beautiful house over there on East Derby Street, is it? I pass by it sometimes. You know it. Yeah, there's, um, there's a couple of folks that I know from my time in working at the bed and breakfast. They pass by it and they always comment on how well maintained it is, though they've never seen anyone in it. Well, I haven't been there in years, to tell you the truth. I do pay to have it cared for. Oh, and no. luckily, I was endowed with a great inheritance at Tom's passing. But without that, I don't know where I'd be. I have met so many widows that I do whatever I can for, because if not for that, where would I be? Not wearing this hat, I'll tell you that much. Do the Holbrooks uh, aid in any way in the caring of this home? Oh, no, they just donate to the organization at large. And I take nothing from the donations to the organization. I, I have my own means, 
and I live very modestly, as you can see. Who does care for your house? Oh, I've had various caretakers over the years. By any chance, and I'm, again, sorry if this is rude, but, um... You are not rude at all, my dear. Did your husband die from any sort of heart-related conditions? How did you know? Just, um, uh, sneaking suspicion. It was surprising how young he was. It's very painful for me. You don't recall any sight of moths around the time of your husband's death? I wasn't present. I just mm -hmm. found out after. I see. His body was found and apparently his heart just stopped. It's hard to think about. I'm, I'm sorry, pardon me. <laughs> I just miss him so much sometimes, you know. I apologize bringing up difficult memories. That's quite all right. I understand. There's a soft rap at the door and Mary Prentice sticks her head in. Uh, Eleonora, you asked uh, to be informed when Elizabeth Woodley arrived. Are, are you all right? Oh, <laughs> of course, I'm fine. Just speaking of rather sad matters. I appreciate you, Mary. She nods. Mary seems to know exactly what she's talking about. Um, are you able to see Elizabeth? Uh, she wanted to go over the uh, advertisements for the Arkham Recorder Star and, uh, well, uh, the fundraising. Absolutely. Well, I am being called, but please finish your tea. Don't let me rush you. It was such a pleasure to meet each of you. And the Daughters of Grace is always seeking new membership. If you're interested in volunteering. Thank you for the offer. And do be careful with your kindness and grace and such what seem to be turbulent and tr troublesome times. I, I would hate to see anyone take advantage of that kindness. Vic, I do appreciate you. Best of luck. Shall I see your guests out? Please, um, if that's all right. Pardon me? Thank you, Mary. Of course. As you leave the drawing room, Eleonora is met in the hallway by a woman you assume is Elizabeth Woodley. She has a sheaf of papers in her hands and begins excitedly talking about uh, possible fundraisers, and there also is talk of an advertisement that's being placed in the Arkham uh, Star Recorder Star. Mary Prentice sees you to the door and cheerfully waves goodbye. Thank you so much for coming by. And as you step into the street, having spent a fair bit of time speaking with Eleonora Birch in her home, it's time to head to your appointed meeting with Pippa. We need to drive to that? Or a taxi? Mm -hmm. or... <laughs> I think, again, we've established, uh, as we've established, Arkham is not a particularly large town. Okay. It should, right. you, should, you have time to reach it on foot. Just make our way. I think we just met Nellie Dinsley. I would agree. Not that I think she had any idea what was being done with her home. She seemed a little out of out of the loop there. Yes. Just more questions. I mean, she did know something about the moth when you showed her, but indeed. I don't know if it's anything beyond the. Connection to the pestilence. Or well, maybe to her husband. I don't know. She wasn't there, or so she says. It's hard to say. She was very coy about all of this. I felt like some sort of pressure on her. Maybe something we weren't seeing. Yeah. I didn't get the sense that she's done anything wrong, but I, I can't shake the feeling that there's something she's not telling us. I agree. Well, now we know where she lives. Well, I suppose. <sighs> we should really go meet Pippa. I don't want to leave her alone and whatever she may be getting mixed up in. Uh -huh. Would I know of any ponds south of Salem? Summoner's Pond. It's not particularly well known. It's not an area for picnicking or anything like that. Does that seem to be where we've been directed, though? 
Mm -hmm. When you arrive, the pond is bathed in sunlight, the waters sparkling softly. In the reeds and the banks, crickets chirp gently. The rocks and banks around the pond are softened by a thick bed of mosses and ferns. The air is fragrant and filled with bird song. You wait for Pippa. The appointed time comes and goes. She seems to be late. Having spent some time in the area, could I please get a spot hidden from everyone? Success. Success. Fumble. <laughs> Success. Vic, you're distracted. You're trying to piece everything together, going over the details, maybe even pulling out pieces of paper, letters, files. So you don't notice something that the others do. As I mentioned, the air is fragrant and filled with birdsong. But having been here a while, you start to realize that every few minutes, exactly the same set of birdsong happens. The same refrains sing out. Similarly, the cricket chirps follow a repeating rhythm. Now, a modern ear might hear this as a looped recording. Also, with your spot hidden, you notice that there are little figures, effigies, surrounding the pond, placed in irregular places. Odd little dollies, almost, suspended in the reeds or with their little feet stuck in the mud. There's sigils etched into old pieces of driftwood or carved out of the mosses and lichen in the rocks. And brightly colored ribbons threaded among the bushes, garlands of flower carefully placed along the banks. Thank On one side of the pond is a sort of muddy beach, a thick, smooth incline of brownish-gray clay that runs down to the water. Sigils are etched into its margins, which rise like banks around the edges of the beach, as though the surface of the muddy clay used to be higher. Now, with your spot hidden, you realize that there are marks of digging in the soft mud. Trowels or small shovels have been used to remove great clods of it. Could I get everyone, including Vic, to make a power roll? No. Oh. Success. Extreme success. Hmm. Success. Failure. Theodore, you did notice these things and you're intent on observing them. The other two, also, you'd been observing these things and perhaps you're looking closer at them. And Vic, you look up from your case notes for a moment. The three of you all see the same thing. For a moment, this beautiful setting seems to flicker. And behind it, you see a pond is dark and thick. The entire place has a feeling of malevolence to it. Not beauty, certainly not beauty. And then it's back the way it was, and the same bird song, the same repeating sound of the crickets. Did, did you just see that? I did. What was that? Something's not right. Theodore, you're not quite sure what the others are talking about. I mean, I'm seeing all of this creepy symbols and little dolls. What are you what? talking about? I don't know. Every, everything just disappeared a moment, right? I move towards one of the effigies. Is it stuck in the ground, or is it? Can I pick it up? There, uh, there are both available. There's some that are stuck in the mud, and there are some that are tied to the reeds. I take one, mm -hmm. pull it from the reeds, and I throw it into the pond. As something made mostly of straw and wood, it seems That's... to float. What are you doing? I think just seeing if it's really there, right? I don't know how to explain it. Things just got really 
dark and weird for like a second, and then, and then it wasn't. Just glad it wasn't just me. Among our spot hiddens, uh, someone had a hard success, yes, or an extreme. I had an extreme success. Betty. As you move a little closer past the pond, you see a path, old and overgrown, leading away from the pond and up the hill to a small cottage, which is almost hidden by the trees that surround it. But again, with your success, you spot it. You realize, yeah, there, there's a little cottage up there. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a cottage right up there. Do you see that? Do I? See it now, that, she's now, that, yeah. now that Betty points it out, everyone can see it. Yes. Does this is that who do you think is leaving all that stuff around here? Maybe uh, Pippa is Isn't late. Pippa? Perhaps she went up the way. Might be worth checking at least. Uh, are there any butterflies or moths around at all? You don't seem to spot any, including. Those who had very high successes, no, not butterflies. Again, there's the crickets, but <laughs> you don't actually see any crickets. Again, you're hearing this same repeating rhythm of cricket sounds. And again, there, there it is. Yes, that same bird song repeating. That is weird. I'm gonna pick up one of the effigies. What is it like made of? Twigs, bits Just of twigs. straw. Yeah. I put one in my pocket. Very well. Do you, um, do you suspect that maybe Pippa wasn't the one that left us this note? I wrote the letter. I don't know. It's, it sounded, it sounded like her. It did sound like her, but, but then again, perhaps someone interfered. We uh, either leave or push deeper. I'm going in. I'm not going in without a gun. I'm going in. To the cot. I, I think it's worth going. Whoever lives there might have seen Pippa if she did come through earlier. Maybe. Maybe that's the place we're supposed to actually meet. Perhaps. Though she did give pretty uh, obvious instructions towards the pond. But. That's true. Just a <laughs> clarification. Are you drawing your weapon? No, but it, I'm making sure it's loaded. Very well. So and it's pull it out, check it. Yeah. Right. Put it, put it back in your pocket. And as you approach the cottage, you see that it's a simple wooden structure. If you have to guess, it looks to be like very rustic, maybe late 17th century. It's rugged, but neat, weather-worn, but undamaged. It looks as though it's been cared for over the years, despite its age of centuries. There is a simple latch holding the front door closed. I'm just gonna open it. Yeah. I'm not even oh, knocking at this. Oh, we don't knock point. anymore, all right. <laughs> you, op you open it and find a single room, apparently unchanged in the centuries since it was built, but again, kept clean and neat. In one corner, there's an old pot-bellied stove, a round blackened pot sitting atop it, and a wooden rocker sitting to one side. An old wooden table stands beneath the window. Above it hang garlands and posies of dried herbs and flowers, so ancient they can't even be recognized, along with old copper pans, knives, and ladles. In the furthest corner from the wooden door is a cot, its mattress and coverlet long gone, it stands bare and empty. At the end of the cot is an alcove containing a set of rough shelves upon which various jars and bottles are sitting. Some of them are empty, some of them, whatever they were contained are so ancient that they've dried to dust. There's also a pestle and a mortar and various other kitchen utensils, rough bowls and cups. The top shelf draws your eye. You were looking for moths earlier, and there are a pair of carved moths attached to either end. And on the top shelf is a book bound in old soft leather. I'm gonna reach right for that book. 
You take the book <laughs> from the shelf. I take the book from the shelf. As mentioned, it's an old book bound in soft leather, which is still supple to the touch. It's held shut by a ribbon tied around it. Can I? Uh, I'm going to open it. Open it. As you open it, a page flutters out, falling to the floor, wafted across the room, and landing on the floor. Oh. Uh. It reads, Daughter's mine. They are coming for me. The auguries are playing in the air, in the grass. This time I cannot escape. I will not keep running like a stag before hounds. Their pestilence of hatred has made me to be a monster, but it cannot destroy me. Only at the hand of the child may the mother truly die. Look for me in your dreams, for there shall I reside with the kind mother. Remember her teaching. Call on her in your need. Keep faith and remain true to yourselves, you daughters of wisdom, you daughters of strength, you daughters of grace. The letter is signed, Mother Fowler. Oh, that doesn't sound good. No. <sighs> Who is Mother Fowler? It's not the kind mother, she references it. And who is they that's after them? I, I don't know. Do you think that's who lives here? Well, the fauna, I, I would presume so. Or maybe it was a letter sent to the person who lives, I don't know. That sure. they preserved, yes. How old does it look? Ancient, centuries perhaps. But as mentioned, the leather of the book is soft and supple to the touch. So this page fell out of this book, but what is this book exactly? As you open it, you can see that, like the letter, it is written in English, though perhaps in a very archaic script. There are headings within the book. It seems to be instructions, rituals. If one was more fanciful, one might call them spells. Many spells. Some to determine the best time to plant, some to determine the weather. But a few stand out. These are longer rituals. The headings read as follow. Bind bones. Summon unquiet spirit. Enchant knife. And summon the kind mother. There's a spell or there's a ritual in here that summons the kind mother. I thought. I thought that was just like, she was just like a figure of, like a symbol. That's what it seemed when Mrs. Birch explained it to us. It's, she's within us all, but this seems more literal. Well, can I take a closer look at that, that spell or that ritual? Yes, what does it say to do? Under the heading, Summon the Kind Mother, you find the following instructions. When nine sisters have been purified in the rite of the Dugai, that's D-U-G-G-A-E, and stand ready to become true children, you may call upon the Kind Mother. Gather butterfly milkweed, lifting soil and root. Plant half at the place of summoning. Take what is left, and crush to make the milk. Ferment the milk until the smell is pungent. Add fresh blood, unwillingly given, and drink entire while the blood is warm. Call upon the kind mother. Your voice will reach her in the land of dream. Speak these words. Gazanir, awake. The way is prepared. 
Come unto the place of summoning. Go unto the place and greet her. Be not afraid of her aspect, but walk into her arms where she welcomes you. You remember the art piece we saw in the library with the nine cherubim around the angel? Yes, mm -hmm. that's what I was thinking. But this doesn't seem like Daughters of Grace things. Perhaps. We're in a, a witch's hut. Perhaps we didn't know we were dealing with witches. I don't know. It could be anything at this point. Uh, maybe some of those women don't know. Maybe only some do. You need unwilling maybe. blood. Doesn't sound kind. No. But wasn't there also something about the worship? They thought they worshipped Ishtar. Something about worshipping something and it not being really what it was or what it appeared to be. And, and yet, in what we saw, the coming of this angel and and and. The, the kind mother, so to speak, and these daughters of grace is what helped all the afflicted during the last, during the pestilence. And if it is about to happen again, now that these moths have reappeared, I, I don't know. Is, is she supposed to come? Is she what will save it from spreading? I don't know if she's supposed to come or if she was summoned. The passages that you were referring to are, of course, in a book that is, thanks to uh, the light fingers of Theodore, in your possession, A Modern Woman's Guide to Myth and Legend, mm. specifically the addendum referring to cuckoo gods. I believe that you have that with you if you want to refer to it, or if you like, uh, if it's easier, I can read for you. I remember there being words and passages about some entities pretending to be gods that they weren't, some using that image to collect followers and then get them to do their bidding in the name of good, and turns out they're not. And the idiots called the scourge moth, thinking it was the butterfly. Yes. The exact passage was, and the idiots called the scourge moth, and walked into its arms, thinking it was the butterfly. Walked into its arms, just like it says here. So we don't do that. So the kind mother does not seem so kind anymore. If we are to trust which passages we choose to trust is the question. The other passages, which Abigail Trout referred to in her addendum, Cuckoo Gods, were found from throughout world mythology, a Babylonian passage which was, they thought they worshipped at the feet of Ishtar, but it was the hunger they called. From Welsh, she called herself Branwyn, and we made her a feast, but she lied, and her name was Carnage. Maybe the, the feast is this ritual of the blood and the, was it milk of butterflies? Milk of um, a plant. Oh, milk of a plant. Which is named a butterfly. <clears throat> so do we think the Daughters of Grace are in fact involved in this? Or they think that they are doing good? And how does this have to do with the Holbrooks and, and the marriage and the digging up corpses? And <sighs> I, I don't It's know. like the more we find out, the more confusing it all gets. What else is in this room? As mentioned, something that drew your attention before was this shelf. The top shelf had a pair of carved moths attached to either side. And as you look, you realize that yes, they are the same archaic moths, the same wing venation. And as you get close, you can see that they are carved with mandibles. Maybe, maybe we just take the book and leave for now. 
Could I get a spot hidden as you are examining this shelf with this carved moths? Could I do a spot hidden to search for any sleek surfaces? Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, the same patina, of course. Extreme. And I assume you're an extreme success. Success. Right? Mm. Extreme success. Mm, failure. <laughs> Regular success. Mm. Our two extreme successes. Vic, you're, again, looking for this particular patina, so you may actually be running your fingers across this. And Theodore, you're also examining. You're each taking one of the moths and looking at it, and you happen to both press at the same time as a click suddenly echoes. A piece of the wall slides back to reveal a small hole. Steady. Within the hole is an ornate mahogany box. The top is carved with the words, the rites of the Dugai, the same word that you saw in the grimoire. Around the words, many moths are intricately carved, and above is an angelic figure, its wings outstretched, very similar to that in the symbol of the Daughters of Grace. Is there a lock on the front of the box, or is it just Mm -hmm. a lid? It just opens. Inside the mahogany box, which looks built to contain much more, you find a single piece of parchment. One sheet, this sheet, as a matter of fact, and once again, it was Vic and Theodore who found it, but uh, I certainly can read that for you because it's not necessarily so legible. Looks fantastic, the, though. The time of rapture, oh. for in the time of suffering, the kind mother shall come and she shall heal all. And the time of her coming shall be the time of need. Her daughters shall prepare the path. They shall bring nine of their sisters to the temple. Find the nine shall be honored with the right right of the Dugai, which shall sanctify them. And when the nine are gathered, they then may the kind mother be summoned in all her glory. The nine perfected ones shall become the true children, and the wings of the true children shall carry them aloft, and the frail and foolish shall be filled with awe. Then the daughters will soothe all fears and say, Lo, see where the kind mother rises, and lo, see how she opens her arms to welcome all. They will give voice to the old name and cry, Gazanir, Gazanir, hail mother. And the true children shall guide the fearful on that all will find sanctuary, that all will find peace, that all will be healed in the arms of the kind mother. As you finish reading the passage, suddenly the light outside the window darkens. The windows and door rattle. Metal utensils clatter against each other as though in a strong breeze. The pot-bellied stove suddenly belches, crackles, and a blazing fire bursts into light inside it. And suddenly, you are all elsewhere. When you dream, you rarely remember falling asleep. And so it is now. Each of you is alone. Theodore, you're in a lovely forest glade, the sun filtering through the autumn colors. You stand in a drift of thick, soft leaves, holding a rake. Leaves are falling and piling high around your legs, deeper and deeper. As the leaves fall, so too does night. And soon a bone moon throws deep, splintered shadows through the skeletal winter trees. Out of the darkness, a figure rushes, barreling towards you. It's him. The drifter. The father of your son. Hank? The cause of his death. It's Hank. 
You hit him with the rake again and again. As you did that night in the woods just months ago. He crumples to the ground. A ray of moonlight falls across his face. And it's Anna Lund. Her long blonde hair spread like silk in the mud. Her face torn by the tines of the rake. You've not seen her face, but you know it's her. Hannah. She stares blindly at you. I am here. A voice emanates from her face, though her lips do not move. I was in her mouth, and then she swallowed me whole. Again, a figure rushes at you out of the darkness, small and fierce and screaming. This time your hands are empty, and the figure, it's your son. He carries the rake, and before you can raise your hands to defend yourself, he hits you with it again and again, like you hit Hank. The tines tear into your face, pierce your eyes, and you fall. Vic. Vic, you're in your childhood home. A warm fire burns in the hearth in the living room. The smell of baking cookies comes from the kitchen. And the sound of soft weeping echoes from overhead. Your sister sits before the hearth, winging a blanket between her hands. The fire dies suddenly extinguished as your sister turns to look at you with dry, empty eyes. Where's Abigail? Did you bring her home? Did you bring her home? I tried. You continue to the kitchen. The soft weeping overhead grows louder. The kitchen's dim, the stove is cold. Your sister stands, running a rolling pin back and forth, back and forth across a bare table. She looks up, her eyes dry and empty. Did you bring her home? It accompanies the rhythmic rolling. Did you bring her home? I, Did you bring her home? I couldn't, I, I, I Did don't Did you bring know. her home? I don't know where she is. The weeping continues overhead. You find yourself walking up the stairs. From the small back bedroom, an icy breeze sweeps through an open window, and the weeping turns to soft laughter. Your sister stands in the dim nursery, laughing and laughing, as she reaches into the crib to lift something into her arms. She turns to look at you, her eyes bright with joyful tears. It's Abigail. They brought her home. They brought her home, look! She turns to show you the baby in her arms. It is a great and glistening pupa. As you watch, the pupa splits open. Legs, insectile legs emerge no, 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 no. as a vast moth crawls out. No. As your sister gazes down lovingly, the moth opens its mandibles, clamps them onto her neck, no. beginning to drink. Your sister smiles, still laughing softly. She cradles the great moth as it drains her dry. Betty, you stand in the middle of a boxing ring, in the middle of a long and echoing warehouse. Thick dust motes float in the air of sunlight that filter through the huge, murky windows. You can hear footsteps outside approaching, many footsteps, like an army approaching. Shadows start to file past the windows, circling the building. You prepare. You feel your blood rising, your muscles tensing. The 
shadows which now densely surround the building pause and there is silence. And then, in one crashing blow, the possessors of the shadows burst through the walls, hundreds of people, and they all advance towards you, their footsteps rhythmic, relentless. You prepare to defend yourself, but as the first of the individuals clambers through the ropes, you see that it's someone you know, your oldest childhood friend, Jimmy. But Jimmy's eyes are glazed as he stumbles towards you. You reach out your arms to catch him, but instead of embracing him, you find your fist connecting with his cheek, delivering a devastating punch. His head rocks back, his neck snaps, and he collapses before you, one of his eyes lolling out of its socket. Jimmy, no! You have no time to respond before the next person is upon you. Your sister, Alice. And again, even as you reach to clasp her, even as you reach to clasp your beloved sister, your traitorous hands ball into fists and deliver a killing blow, no! shattering her jaw, breaking her neck. You scream at them to stop, but please stop coming at her. But more and more people clamber blindly through the ropes into the ring where you stand, unable to stop. Your hands of their own accord, delivering blow after killing blow. Stop! An endless flood of friends, of loved ones, piling up in the killing field around your feet as you scream and beg them to stop. Archibald. Archibald. You're in a hospital tent. You know it well. The walls and roof are light, billowing silk. There's a long row of beds, all crisply made with white cotton sheets, all empty except one, in which lies an injured soldier you remember his face, the soldier you tried and failed to save. He is the soldier. You are the soldier. You're lying in the bed. Cool sheets pulled tight across your feverish skin. Black blood wells up in your throat in your eyes. You choke, gasping for breath. The light dims as a figure stands over you, her heavy jewelry glinting in the waning light. I can make you whole. Speak the old name, and I will come for thee, and hold thee in my arms for all eternity. Safe and warm, my special boy. She draws her scarf back, and a long column of black smoke uncurls like a tongue, snaking its way into your mouth, <clears throat> sucking the breath from your throat. But even as you draw in, you feel the smoke tongue press down further, down your tortured trachea, filling your lungs. The hospital tent is now filled with soldiers, all standing beside their beds, ankle deep in thick black mud. They face one end of the tent, where a ziggurat, many angled, crumbling stone, emerges from the i from the mud. Upon it stands the woman, clothed in flowing silks of rich browns and gold, an intricate pattern of perfect symmetry. As the ziggurat rises, so does the mud, crawling up the bodies of the soldiers where they stand. The woman turns to face them. It is Anna Lund. You've not seen her face, but you know it's her. The long blonde hair flowing as if she is underwater. 
she has worn a thousand masks, but none of them are hers. She reaches up, puts her fingers into her mouth, and rips her own face open. Beyond it is the void, a screaming eternity. And with that, all of you awaken. <laughs> Theodore, you have a large carving fork, two tines clutched above your own face. Betty, you're on the verge of thrusting both of your hands into the burning wood stove. Vic, you stand by the empty bed, reaching out, your throat tight. Your sister was there a moment ago, wasn't she? The crib, the moth, and Archibald. You lie on the floor, your face buried in it as if you were trying to force your way through the floorboards. You come to yourselves. The fork clatters to the ground. Betty, you withdraw your hands. You could feel the heat of the fire, but you're not burned. You hadn't quite thrust them within it. This is madness. You do not wish to stay here. The fire suddenly dies. And all is as it was when you entered. Did you all see her? See who? Anna. I, I saw her. I, I, don't, I don't... I don't think so. I... I I don't know. No, no, I, I... I didn't. What was that? I don't know. I don't know. Something, don't something know. is in our minds. Something, something. Can we go? Yes, let's go. Yes. Now. You leave the place. Do you take the book? Yes. Yeah. And you'll take the papers you found as well? Yes putting them with the rest. We should burn it. Nothing good, this kind mother, this, this is no kind mother, this is some, some demon, some devil trying to get within our heads. We should burn the book. And thank you all for that. Is everyone all right to continue? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I have to ask you for sanity rolls. Failure. Success. Success. Failure. A point of sanity for each of you. As you stuff the grimoire and the sheets of parchment into the bag that's holding your various papers, Pippa's letter catches your eye. And you look out towards the pond. She's still not there. But atop the letter, as you'll see in the prop you have, her address. I think we should rid of the book. I'm telling you, I, no good will come of it. I don't know if it will burn, Vic. You don't know if burning it's gonna get rid of it. It's better to not be in the hands of whoever is using it for whatever this is. Yeah, what if we burn it and then it rematerializes itself in that house. Fine. I, I, I will not keep it. I want nothing to do with it. Pippa's I'm... still not here. I'm willing to keep it if you are. If you aren't. I... I hold on to it to now. I think. That's all right. Archibald, you're 
keeping the book with the rest of the papers in your yes. bag? Yes. Very well. When we go back down to the pond, can we see it the same as before? Again, that same repeating loop of birdsong and crickets. But those of you who saw beyond it, you know what you saw is the truth of the matter. Whatever this is, whatever you're seeing now, this is the lie. Something. We can't see it anymore, that this is something. This isn't right. How do we see the truth? I don't know, but I don't think we can see it here. We must, we must find Pippa. I agree. We need to make sure she's okay. Yes. As mentioned, on the stationery on which Pippa's letter was written, you see her address. The stationery reads, Mrs. George Franklin. The address is 428 Jenkins Street. Your intention is to make your way there? Yes. Yeah. As you approach 428 Jenkins Street, Pippa Franklin's address, you see a familiar figure leave the house, Gwendolyn Tillinghast. And she is not alone. There are four other women, all of whom bear themselves with the same almost supernatural grace and poise as Gwendolyn Tillinghast, the same sort of grace that you witnessed from Miss Holbrook. The five women turn as one as they leave the house and continue up the street. What have they done? A rush to the house. I follow. Yeah. Yeah. You rush to the house and find the door unlocked, and the, the house very clean indeed. Pippa. 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 We call out and receive no response, and I'll give this to you without need for a spot hidden, since you're quite familiar with it. On the flat surfaces, that same patina, that oh, gloss. No. No, we must. Can we run back out? Let's follow them. Yes. You see at the corner, they're not facing you, but you see the women, they're walking along the street. You think that if you follow at a discreet distance, you can follow them. They cut quite the image as they walk down the street. You can see people taking note of them, men tipping their hats. Some people just stare openly as they move down the street. Let's be discreet. <sighs> Try to find. And it's not long before you realize they're headed towards a very familiar address, the Dinsley House. Wait. You watch them enter the house. What would you like to do next? They've done something to Pippa. I know it. I've got my hand on my gun. Same. We don't know what... We don't know what they're capable of. I mean, moths have flown out of mouths and they're practically perfect. Maybe they have mandibles hidden somewhere under those weirdly symmetrical faces. Yes, 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 maybe, maybe they do. What are we going to do? We can't let them roam about the place like parasites on the society. What if we go in and it's for nothing? Who are we going to tell? Who's going to stop them if not us? I'm willing to go. I just want us all to be prepared that we're not prepared. We're as prepared as we can be. I don't know what else we can do. Having been to the house before, 
you are aware of where windows are and such, and you know that the large living room has a window that has some shrubbery about it. You mm -hmm. might be able to conceal yourself if you want to eavesdrop or spy. And of course, you know the layout of the house as well. Let's do uh, that then. <laughs> yeah, let's see if, if they are visible from the windows at least, if we could hear what they're saying. Yeah, or crouch underneath and listen. Yes, we'll go hide. As you approach, I assume you're trying to be quiet. Yes. So I will ask for stealth rolls from all of you. I'm going to use 20 luck points. Very well. Nice. 16 luck points. 16 luck, great. Remember, you can push rolls as well. Oh. Oh. Wow. Though failed, a great failed risk. push will be... Yeah, I, it's safer for me to spend these You'd rather spend points. the luck. Yeah, because well. my, it's, even if I roll again, not great odds. Very good. Success! Great. Shockingly. I will do that also. You're going to burn luck? Yeah, because well. I really don't want to... Don't want to mess it up. <laughs> that might be advisable. Managing to approach the house with a degree of stealth and peer in through windows. You see six immaculate ladies sitting around the dining table, which has been laid with a pretty tea set. Same tea set you observed at the Welsh dresser when you broke into the house earlier. One of the women is Gwendolyn Tillingast, and the others uh, you recognize several that were at Pippa Franklin's house, and one more that you don't recognize, who must have been here, perhaps admitted them. All are flawless, smiling brightly, chattering quietly. They pour tea and serve themselves delicate sandwiches and what looks like little sausages. When Nancy Holbrook comes through the door from the kitchen, Good afternoon, ladies. My lace wings. Now, you haven't started tea without waiting to welcome our newest member, have you? She stands back and gestures at the doorway, as all of the women make anticipatory little sounds of excitement. And again, though you've never laid eyes on her in life, some of you have seen her in dreams. Anna Lund enters, flawless and smiling. Her long blonde hair neatly caught up in elegant curls. But again, Anna, but changed from what you saw in dreams. Now the same luminous beauty, the same perfect symmetry to her features. All of the women gasp and smile, lightly clapping their gloved hands. Oh, Anna, my dear, you are quite lovely. Welcome, dear Anna, you are a picture. Anna nods graciously and smiles around the room. One of the women asks, but where is Mrs. Llewellyn? Nancy gives a little smile of disappointment. Unfortunately, poor dear Hannah Llewellyn did not quite manage the journey. Oh, oh my, what a shame, cry the women. I know, it really is too bad, men. You can't trust them to get anything right, can you? Nancy gives a little chuckle. All the women laugh in agreement. <laughs> if you want something done right, you better just do it yourself. <laughs> However, says Nancy, we do have another guest to make up our numbers. Mrs. Tillingast, if you would so kindly assist me. Gwendolyn follows Nancy to the kitchen, and they return a moment later, carrying a chair, on which sits... Pippa Franklin. Pippa is glassy-eyed and unresponsive, but all the women respond with delight. Oh, Mrs. Franklin! Oh, how wonderful! Yes, how wonderful! Gwendolyn and Nancy place Pippa's chair at the table. They seem to be carrying it without much effort. We must all take good care of Mrs. Franklin as she is to become a lace wing this very evening. This evening? Why, yes. The Dugai rites are being prepared as we speak. There's no time to be lost. Now dig in, my dears. You must be hungry. I shall fetch the main course. Nancy exits as two of the women go to Pippa and start to brush and braid her hair and gently wipe her face with a napkin. 
The other women start nibbling delicately at the sandwiches and sausages. Could I please get spot hidden? Success. Success. Presumably because they're seething with rage right now. <laughs> A fumble. <laughs> Hard success. Yes, Vic, you feel the blood rising. In fact, you clench your eyes closed. You in particular notice this, Theodore. Uh, the ladies eating the sausages are nibbling carefully along the sides as though there's something inedible in the middle. Nancy returns with a large serving salver with a great silver cloche on top, sort of dome. It's truly huge. It, she carries it with her arms outstretched to reach, to reach the edges, but again, though it must be heavy, she doesn't seem bothered by it. The women applaud again and hurry to make space on the table. One of the women who is eating a sausage tosses the remains onto her plate. They clatter on the china. Nancy sets the salver on the table and whips the cloche off with a flourish. Players, might I ask you all to close your eyes? Please open your eyes. <laughs> Upon the salver oh is a human torso. There are also a pair of hands, though the fingers have been removed, and you realize what clattered against the china was a set of ragged finger bones after they'd been gnawed clean. The head is also gone, and the torso has been split down the center stuffed and dressed with a display of lettuce leaves, sliced vegetables and fruit garnishes which explode in a profusion of color from the abdominal cavity. Spot him, please. Can Theodore take a moment to uh, vomit? Make a barf roll. <laughs> yeah. no. I'll give you that without a roll. <laughs> Thanks. Hard success. Mm -hmm. Also a hard success. I wish it wasn't. Though. Extreme success. No, <laughs> we don't want to know. Of course. Hard success. <laughs> you all notice, even at this distance, the torso is rather large, and there on one of the fingerless hands, and the web between the thumb and the hand itself, a moth tattoo. The women ooh and ah. Oh, Mrs. Holbrook, you have outdone yourself. Nancy smiles. Oh, oh, I'll go on. Uh, tuck in, everyone. We have a busy evening ahead. The women's faces, the women who have been called lace wings, their faces change. Long, slick, Black proboscises extend from their mouths and snake across the table, first delicately sipping at the juices of the torso with a hideously soft slurping sound, then curling around pieces of meat, tearing them free. The faces change again, mouths opening wide and lips peeling back to reveal a pair of serrated mandibles pale pink and slick with saliva. The proboscises twist back towards the mandibles, bearing hunks of flesh, and the mandibles crunch down, chewing the meat before the lace wings toss back their heads to swallow. <laughs> they all begin feasting. Sorry, Nora needs to make a sanity roll. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like sanity. Jones. Yeah. For me. <laughs> okay. <sighs> yeah, that's a failure. Failure. Extreme success. <laughs> Extreme success. I've seen. I rolled Betty's, a two. Betty's seen some stuff. Uh, that was a failure for me then. Failure. Yes. Success for me. Extreme success. Success. Failure. Failure. Yeah. yeah. Archibald. Vic. You lose two points of sanity each. Could be worse. Could be. 
as the lace wings continue their feast, and you see some of them begin to tear off bits of meat and to bear them towards Pippa. No, 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 we have to stop this. We have to stop this, Pippa's still in there. We, we get it, this is, we have to stop. It's too to late stop. for us. You think it's too late? She's, she's not, she's, she, she must still be in there somewhere. They're, they're trying to, to turn her into one of them. Shh, she's, the best she's, we can do is... She's going to be the ninth one. We have to stop them. We can't let this happen. The mandibles and proboscis of Nancy retract. Soon, soon you will join us, dear, dear Pippa. Again, it snakes forth and tears off some meat. Are you going to observe any longer? Yeah, I'm gonna, I just, I, I don't think I could like take my eyes away for a second. This is like a train wreck that I can't look away from. What is this house made of? Mm, I would think given the area, brick and wood, obviously. And at the mention of saying that like, oh, it's too late for her, I, I think Betty would look in and just try to take in whatever information she can gather from. You did hear them mention the fact that she would be joining them soon. soon. Anna is feasting like the others. Pippa is not. Pippa seems to be treated like a guest here at these festivities. We failed her, we failed her. We just look at her. I don't know if they can come back from this. It's not too late for Pippa though, right? I mean, it's not we too late. We don't know. Doctor, look at Charles, it's not too late. Nick, it's not too late. Everyone, it's not too late. You must get her. Yes, but understand this. We are outnumbered, outgunned, outmatched here. No one would help us, even now. These are the ladies of this town. They said they'll be joining her tonight. I believe she can be saved. But we can't do it here. We have to know where this is going to happen. Whether it's at the pond or back or somewhere. When we have that, then we can act. But here and now, we would only be dooming her and us. But yes, Vic, yes, she can be saved. Yes, yes, Doctor. She can be saved. Yes. It is not too late. It is not too late. It's not too late. I don't know if I believe you, Doc, but I, and just believe me for now, please. It's the last bit of hope we have. Then cling to it for all it's worth. For all of our sakes. You look up to see Anna Lund cleaning the bones of the hand with the moth tattoo, slurping greedily at the meat. In fact, the torso has been nearly picked clean as you held your huddled, hushed discussion. And now, the ladies clear the table and several of them drop down to all fours as their proboscises lash out, licking the floor and the table clean. That same gloss, that shiny patina. They straighten up, fix their hair, and two of them support Pippa 
as Nancy tells them all, it's time to go, ladies. Our ride will be here soon. All right. Are they, are they taking her with them? They seem to be. We have to keep following them. We, I agree. We need to keep following them. Yes. I look around the street like, are, if a ride comes here, will we still be hidden from view? You move towards the street to get a better view, and you actually see three Ford Model Ts coming this way down the street. You assume their destination is this house. You probably would need to shift yourselves. In fact, you see a hedge that you might all be able to hide behind that would block the view from the front door, assuming they leave through the front door, but still allow you to observe the street. Okay. Qu quick. Go. Very good. Are we just going to keep following them all night? What else are we going to do? What else can we do? I don't just, know. Just the doctor says. The doctor said. Maybe we smash their cars up so they can't leave or something. You see the cars pull up and a horn is sounded. And in short order, the ladies leave the house. Nine individuals, including Pippa, who is supported by two of the lace wings. They get into the cars, and you notice that the drivers are all women. Could ready? I please get a spot hidden? Success. Failure. Success. Success. Those who made a success recognize the woman as Mary Prentice, one of the Daughters of Grace who you met working at the soup kitchen. As you realize, it will be a bit of a struggle to keep up on foot, but it might be possible. Let's go. Do I see a car on the street? Give me luck. Success. Yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, just down the block, there does seem to be a car and with a successful luck roll, it's idling. <laughs> Someone I, must have run into a house to get something. I don't even ask questions. I just point and then rush towards it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very well. The Model Ts have already pulled past it, but that might be good because you don't want to be running past them. As I mentioned, it is idling. You all pile in. Who's driving? I'll good get in the car. I'll get in the, I'll get in the driver's seat. Very good. <laughs> I assume you have the highest drive skill. I probably. I think we discussed this beforehand. Yeah, I think, I think, I think yeah. so. I think you do. Very good. Uh, this is by no means a high-speed chase, uh, but I assume you're taking care not to be noticed? Yeah, as best as I can. Very good. Hmm, give me drive. Mm. Okay, let's do since that. Since we talked about that your drive skills. First. Hard success. Nice. The three Model Ts take you to a familiar destination, the Arkham Athenaeum Club. The cars pull up outside a side door. The Lace Wings, accompanied by Pippa and the three Daughters of Grace that were their drivers, enter the building, the Arkham Athenaeum Club as all 12 women disappear inside the building. What is your intent? All right, well, let's talk about this. What do we want to do? You think they're taking them to the old surgery building? That would be my guess. I... If this, and I point to the book in the bag, if this is being conducted, perhaps interrupting it for whatever they're going to be doing here is a time when they'll be vulnerable. For right now, considering how unwelcome we are, we need to get inside and get back there. That's all I can think of. Unless someone has a better idea, I'm open. Uh, <laughs> You have the rituals. Yes. You have the instructions. I, I, I have it here, yeah, but um, there were these other spells. Do you think any of the other spells might have might do anything to counter this? 
Maybe. Flip through, like, real quick, just to see, yeah. like, remind ourselves there's something. Is there anything here that might be useful to what we're getting ready to do? Use their own means against them. Yeah. And as you begin to pull the grimoire from the leather satchel and feverishly page through it, you note the sun beginning to set. For it was late afternoon when you were at the pond where you were meant to meet Pippa and who knows how long you spent in dreams. But now, night is falling on Arkham and tonight is the time of the ritual. For now, however, we'll end things there. We bring this episode to a close on a bit of a cliffhanger. Thank you for watching Graveyards of Arkham, and we'll see you next time. Mmm. Mmm. Mm.